Okay, uh, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Good morning. Uh, thank you for inviting me back again. So at least I must be doing something right to come back here again next uh, after one year. Okay. Uh, if you come here to learn about e-learning, uh, I won't be talking too much about e-learning. I'll be focusing more on learning, but with also technologies. But if you're really interested to know what I think, I think I gave the talk three years ago, DNA of a 21st century educator. I'm actually doing a webinar which is free on the 3rd of June, Tuesday, next Tuesday, 10 o'clock AM, which is free. You can just go online and see the webinar. It's during a MOOC, but it's, uh, if, if you want to know what it means to be a 21st century educator, uh, according to some of my, uh, my thoughts on that. Okay, but today we're gonna to talk about becoming creative super learners. Uh, and before I start talking, I would like to hear some of you, your views. Uh, what do you think would learning look like in 2024, 10 years from now? Anybody, want, uh, we have a mic here, the mic disappeared, okay. Anybody want to share, what do you think learning will look like in, because I think it's very important to know that, because, uh, at least explore it, because as if we are an education institution, we are managing learning, we should have some ideas what the future of learning will look like, for example, in one decade. Uh, anybody have any imagine, good imagination yet to explore your mind to the future? Huh? Anyone here? No. Uh, <laughs> anyone? It's, it, it's, there's no right answer, so it, that's the good thing about these kind of questions, that you cannot go wrong. Anyone? Okay. I haven't done my morning job. <laughs> you don't need the mic. Okay, please. Sorry, you need a mic. Sorry. <coughs> yeah. Hi, morning. I think in 2024, 20, decades from now, I think not many people will come to class because I think that technology would change the way we learn. That's one thing. And then secondly, I think as educators, if you're not, a big, uh, if you're not ahead of our students, uh, what would be worse is that not many would come to class because they would find that from the net they can learn more than they can from our class. So it's all this staying ahead and also this thinking that well maybe not many would come to class. Okay. So what are we gonna do when nobody comes to class, okay? Uh, anybody wants to elaborate on that? Very good, thank you very much. Thank you. Anyone else? I'm sure you've thought about the future because I think USM have a master plan at least for the next five years. This is my favorite topic. Okay, since you mentioned it, let me tell you something. Uh, people always say technology will change the class. Technology will not change anything. It's the people who will change it. See, technology will change it. Even now, there's so much technology, but our classroom doesn't look very much different from when we go to high school. You build a new school and it still looks the same like it was built 20 years ago. You know? So I wish I wish we could get this orientation right. Technology will not change anything. We are the one who will change anything using technology. Okay, so if you don't get this right, that's why we are still here. E-learning is 20 years old. Not five years old, e-learning is 20 years old. And, and we are still talking about e-learning like it was a long time ago. You know, we've not seen any leaps and bounds. Uh, okay, so if you want to experience an online session, I have one 10 o'clock, you can go to my blog, 10 a.m. On Tuesday, I'll have an online session, which is through during a MOOC. Actually, I, I, I'm sure you know what a MOOC is, right? Uh, so it's during a MOOC. I'm just invited speaking in a MOOC. So I'm not ho 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 holding the course. I just luckily just one session because I do not want to manage thousands of students. Okay, anyone else? Or shall we move on? Okay, at least we had two explorations. Okay, so I just wanted to know. It's interesting. Uh, we don't know what the future will look like. I, I think you remember when the iPad came along. Remember the iPad came along? Nobody needed it, right? Uh, but now it's like uh, even my two-year or four-year-old daughter, since she was two years old, uh, can't live without it uh, the whole day. So there are changes. But whether, as, as, as uh, Prof. Rosen said, whether it, we are the one making the change, not the technology. Technology is just there. Okay. So here are some provocative uh, future learning, learning methods. You might laugh or you might find it funny. Uh, I don't know if you see my slides already, but if you have, it's already online on the slide share. So learn while sleeping. How many of you like to sleep? Uh, <laughs> some people have it. I remember I read in, I, I don't read manga, but I actually sometimes I look through manga 
And I saw some people had the hobby was sleeping. So if their hobby is sleeping, they can become very knowledgeable. Huh? <laughs> but actually, do you, know what, do you know what this movie is, right? Have you seen this movie? Total Recall, right? So some people are actually predicting that there will be devices that you, because we already know from, is there any br neuroscientist here? No neuroscientist here? OK. Then I can tipu tipu lah. No. <laughs> No. Uh, they, they actually have done research on this and they found out when do we learn best? In what state do we learn best? Anyone? What state are you in when you learn best? When you're stressed, do you learn best when you're stressed? How many of you sit for an exam and you're really stressed and you can't remember a thing? Right? So we don't learn best when we're stressed. Which state do we learn when we're best? Relaxed, right? What if you know already you learn very well when you rest? What about when you're super relaxed? When you're sleeping, you, you can absorb anything. Sometimes bad things also, but you know you can absorb. So people are actually looking at that. And if you look at some of the movies today, they have actually put it into the movies. And a lot of things that happen in the movies happen in real life maybe 20 years later, 30 years later. If you watch The Island, if you have a chance to watch The Island, the movie Island, they actually program, they clone people, and, and they program them. And they have these devices, which is called massive open sleeping courses. No. So this is from the movie The Island, and they're actually sleeping and they're imprinting their life story within a short period of time. Okay, we'll get back to this. It's a bit complicated. So instead of massive open online courses, we have massive open sleeping courses. Okay, okay, we call it Delta Brain Wave. We'll get back to that. Okay, another one is learning pills. Okay, how many of you take any supplements to feel better? Okay, how do you keep yourself awake? When USM gives you an assignment that you have to work over 24 hours, huh? coffee. Yeah, it's effective, but most researchers say it's not that effective. Huh? But it is for us. We think it's effective, but not for memorization. It's good for keeping us awake. Huh? But there are actually more and more pills now that can actually help us get close. Not yet to pho you know photographic memory. Photographic memory that you remember anything that you read, anything that you see. And some people say, some researchers say, anyone can have it. It's just you need to come in that state. And what these pills do basically is they open up your mind to be receptive to learning. And it, but the problem is we don't know the side effects. So you don't see it in the market. But there will be maybe a time where you can go, before you study, you just take a pill and you just read it and voila, it's, you know, instead of reading it 20 times, you read it once and it sticks. Okay, but it might be side effects. We never thought, I just give you a bad example. Uh, we never thought Viagra will exist, but it does exist today. So think of it as for learning, OK? And, <laughs> and then this is provocative. What about learning uploads? That's even easier. You don't have to learn. You upload the knowledge. Wouldn't that be nice? You can start working straight away. I go to, it'll be only the rich people. Or they go to shop and go to shop. Uh, like, you know when you buy games? Oh, I buy, I buy uh, today I want to buy introduction to biology. Yeah? And then you go and put it on, and boah, you have the knowledge in you, OK? So people are actually thinking that. And I want to share with you, I, I would recommend that you read this book. How many of you read this book? This is the most important book that I've read about the future of the mind. Because this guy here, Michio Kaku, which is a Japanese-American, or maybe he's Japanese, but he, he sounds like a Japanese-American. You can watch his talk. If you're too lazy to watch, read the book, which will take you a few days or maybe a few hours if you're a speed reader. You can actually watch the video here. It's only one hour. And he talks about everything that's in the book, but on a surface level, OK? This guy is a very interesting guy. And I, he didn't say this, uploading university degree within minutes. He didn't say this. I just put it into him. It's a bubble, OK? But what he mentions in the book is that they have come to the state where they have been able to upload a memory to a mouse, some memory to a mouse. But only existing memory. What they did is they get the mouse to do something, and then the mouse forgets how to do it. And then they upload the memory again, and then the mouse remembers how to do it again. So according to their research, I'm not, this is not my words. Huh? According to research, they have shown that you can actually, uh, up to now, that you can imprint uh, existing forgotten memory. But the question now is, what if we can upload what you call false memories? Now, if you can upload false memories, that means you can upload things that you have not learned before. And that's uh, what they're looking at in the future. And I'm not saying it will happen with human beings. But don't be surprised, maybe in two decades or three decades, those things already exist, OK? So what I mean by creative super learners in this talk is it's a mindset, OK? Always exploring ways to learn, share, and collaborate more efficiently in terms of pace. 
effectively in terms of impact and also creatively. Now, uh, I've actually been consciously trying to rewire my brain since last November. Okay, I'm not successful, I'm learning, this is a long process. But, but I had a lot of interest in it because I did it 10 decades ago. And even when I was studying, I used to be a very bad student, and then I learned some techniques, and suddenly I'm on the dean's list. And I realized that it's not always about knowledge, it's also about techniques that you can benefit a lot, okay? So today what I'm gonna share with you is two levels, okay? Level one, I will build next year. So I will only share you with level one. Okay, level one, we're gonna talk about learning. We're gonna talk about mindsets, okay? How many of you, when you go to give a lecture, do you psychologically prepare yourself, or you just go in the, I'm ready to rock and roll? Yeah. Huh? What about students? Do you teach the students how to prepare mentally before they learn, or mentally before an exam? Now these are things that we will talk about, because it's very important to get your mindset ready when you want to do something, whether you want to innovate, you want to create, and so on. And then reading skills. Can I just ask you how many of you are speed readers here? Or gone through any speed reading course? <coughs> how many have, can read a page? Or see, three pages a minute? Anyone? It's okay, we'll go through today. I'll teach you some ways. Hopefully you can read two pages uh, a minute, maybe more. Okay, memory. This is my challenge. I, whatever I remember, I don't forget, but it comes out differently. But how, are you, how many of you got super memory here? Anyone? Okay, curating. Everybody knows what curating is? The ability to filter knowledge. I mean, when you know that it's information overload, do you have that ability to go in online and find exactly what you want and share it with who you want? And then thinking skills, which is the essence for to be creative and innovative and so on. So this is a program. It drove me actually, uh, I think it was last year, November, this, I was thinking, this is something that was strong in a decade ago, but it's so important, the, the ministry, the government, all the Asian countries, even all the world are talking about, we need to learn how to learn, you know? They always say we need to learn how to learn, but they never tell us how that, what that means, you know? We need to learn how to learn. So this, this level one is trying, I'm still in a learning process, and I don't think this talk or this presentation or this uh, training will be mature before after my Hajj. Uh, inshallah, I'm going for Hajj. <laughs> after that, I'll hopefully get the last inspiration. Uh, and then, uh, uh, but I'm st already started training, because when you train, you learn at the same time, and, you and, and so on. And then, after that, next year, I want to work on this, okay? We'll look at some of these, like writing skills, speaking skills, design skills, and so on. Okay, so learning. What do we know about learning today? Okay? Have you seen this? Who, has anybody listened to his talks before? <laughs> Can you guess what he's doing here? What is he doing, doing here? Okay. Who is his audience? Huh? Yeah, he has actually no face-to-face -face audience. This is how he dresses up when he does a webinar. Kurt Monk, actually you can go to his website. And, he, and he, I remember he's, he, we, he, we invited him to give a webinar to IMU, and uh, I remember he said something that sticked to mind. He said the 21st century is the learning century. And therefore, especially us, I mean educators, academics, we need to, not master, but we need to all the time master that art of sharing information, sharing knowledge, and sharing skills and competencies. On. If we don't do that, more and more the government, I mean the government, the public will actually run away from us. Because that's what it is about this century, it's about how to learn, and of course there's so much, we're we are, we are suffering from information overload. And I can show you some examples before I see Mahatma Gandhi. You've seen this one before? It's a nice statement. Live as if you were to die tomorrow. Learn as if you were to live forever. Okay? So, how does the brain learn? I showed this slide three years ago, so I don't know if anybody attended. But, huh? So, the first thing we need to do is attention. Is this true or not? Huh? We don't pay attention to boring things. Uh, and I, when I usually bring that up with the uh, Lecturers, they'll say to me, I'm not paid, I think I told this before, I'm not paid to entertain. And I, I tell them, you're also not paid to be boring. So you have to find that middle way no? <laughs> to engage the students, okay? So attention is very important. This is according to John Medina, he has done brain research and so on, okay? So I hope you will stay, uh, you will stay back uh, after 
after the tea break. After tea break, we will do some exercise to stimulate the brain with juggling. I will only do it after tea break, because that at least make you more interested to come back okay, after tea break. <laughs> but what time do you want to have the tea break? Now. <laughs> uh, otherwise, uh, okay, what time? Roughly 10, 10.15? 10 10 o'clock, eh? 10 o'clock, okay. So we'll only do the juggling after the tea break. And I hope you come back. For, I was thinking about showing now. If I show now, then maybe you don't come back. So, okay. <laughs> Wiring, okay. We are all, the, uh, every brain according is wired differently. Therefore, it's diff we have to find ways to engage. For, I'll give you an example. I'm sure you experienced this. You taught one semester and you felt like the best teacher in the world, right? And then the next semester comes along, you get an another group of students, and suddenly you feel like the worst teacher in the world. Uh, so it's very important to adjust to the, okay? And then comes the gender. Male and female brains are different. Okay, I'm not an expert in this. I don't want to go into this topic. It's a very sensitive topic. Okay. <laughs> but I just want to sh ask the brothers here, or the men, how many times have you won an argument with your spouse or wife or girlfriend? Have you ever won an argument with them? You have? Tell me your secret, Noah. <laughs> have you noticed? When, when you argue with the, this is, this is actually, when you argue with the lady, she will remember everything, <laughs> even beyond the discussion. And you say, why did I bring up this discussion? Because she's going to go on. But the thing is, men can't remember anything. And when the discussion starts, I say, how to go fishing now? <laughs> and is it very really weird? It's, it's a common thing that ladies are very good uh, when it comes to situations. They remember so much. They can remember 1976, 1982, 1984, 1985, and you're like, I only remember yesterday. Uh, and, and one of the things which is very powerful with memory is emotion. So if you get emotion involved, you're more likely to remember it. And usually women, when you have a discussion, they get emotion involved. Men only when it's brothers fighting each other, then they're But when it comes to women, they like pull back. And then they start thinking about how to get out. They're not even thinking about discussion, they're just thinking how to get out. But the women is like, I'm gonna attack, attack, attack. <laughs> so, so it's quite interesting with the uh, agenda, but this is, uh, you can read the book. I don't want to go into it. It's very interesting. He doesn't bring up arguments thing. I heard this from another lecture. A marriage counselor, by the way. A professional marriage counselor he told me. It was, it's actually a YouTube video, but I'll, maybe if you ask me, I'll share it. It's very funny. OK, memory. This is very important. Repeat to remember. Now, this is the biggest problem that I found when I did university education in not only Malaysia, I mean when I did college in Norway, is that we have to cover so much during the semester, right? I, I did instruction, uh, what, design, system design. We had to cover 17 chapters in 14 weeks. And the lecture had no time even to present. It was so short time, she would say, oh, read this at home. Chow, chow. Read this at home, Chow, chow. read this at home. Now, the thing that they found out about learning is that you need to repeat. And those are, that means, to repeat the means you have to think about it again and again. You have to do it again, practice, practice, practice. And if you don't do that, it won't go into long-term memory. And it won't be able to be recalled. And this is the biggest challenge today, I find, is that if you can make your students interested in what you're teaching, that's enough. Because when people are interested, what happens in their brains when they're interested? What happens? Focus, okay. But one thing which is, it does, I give you an example. I like, I like football. If you tell me a football result, you ask me 10 years later, I remember that result. You know, but if it's something I'm not interested in, I can't remember. And the reason is, it's a very common sense, it's like, when you're interested in something, your brain is continuously thinking about it. You understand? Now? But when you're not interested, you switch off. That's why it's so important to get students interested in it. Find ways to make this interesting, because if, when, the more you do that, students will even think about it beyond the classroom. But if you don't get them interested, they'll, they'll just switch off. That's why most people cannot learn language, unless you are passionate about learning the language. Because the moment you're passionate about language, you go beyond the classroom. You go thinking about how to say this, what to do that, you know? But if you don't go to that level, you won't get, uh, it won't be, unless you've got special memory of it, it won't, you know, it won't stick, okay? Okay, stimulate more senses. It's important to stimulate more senses. But the most important sense is vision. <coughs> and it's very important, uh, visualization. I, I've checked, because I'm studying the brain, neuroscience, and I, I've studied some of the top world champions in memory. And all of them use visualization of words or items or anything to memorize stuff. Visualization. So if you don't visualize it, because words don't stick in our brain. You notice that? If you just read a word without thinking, uh, visualizing it, it's, it just disappears from memory. But the moment you start visualizing, you see pictures in your head. And that's what uh, the super champions in memory, what they do is, 
They see something and they create a story with it, they exaggerate and, and they build in the memory. So vision is very powerful, okay? Stress, stress brains don't learn the same way. Stress, I think you all experience that when you have an exam or when you have a viva or you have a meeting, it's like when you're going to present suddenly, everything's missing. And then after the exam, or person, suddenly everything comes back. Ooh, 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 ooh. And that's because of stress, stress brains like that. And I don't want to quote, but uh, uh, some people say that your brain actually shrinks a bit when you're stressed over a long period of time. Not you, you know the difference between you stress and de-stress? You stress is like, you know when you want to do bungee jumping? It's exciting, but you're stressed, but it's exciting, that's you stress, exciting stress. So it's, not, it's healthy for the body. But when you're distressed, uh, distressed when you're really stressed over a longer period of time, it's not healthy. And it damages your brain and you get a lot of toxic. So it's important to find ways to chill. And are we doing that in our education system? You know, I, I, I know like in Singapore, uh, even I was staying there, there was one that jumped off the building, you know, because of stress and, and pressure and so on. So we have to look at that. how do we work that. Sleep, sleep well, think well, okay. Exercise, exercise boosts brain power, nothing more. Exploration, we are powerful natural explorers. That's why we must make education more explorative than instead of just uh, information, uh, just giving information just like that, okay? So here, based on this, people have looked in terms of how can we design learning uh, so it stimulates the full brain, okay? So one of the things is you need to, according to this lady and uh, her, uh, what? Marie, Marie, uh, Mr. Hardiman, okay. Emotional climate, that means that you need to warm up the audience. Okay, I was planning to warm you up today with uh, using uh, poll everywhere, but we don't have internet access. So I had to do it by the mic, which is okay. okay. We need to warm them up. It's not enough just to come to class and, you know, just start. You need to warm them up. Okay, if you're, has any one of you been an athlete here? If you don't warm up for, in your sport field, I used to play football in Norway. It used to be minus five, minus six. And you can imagine if you go and play football without warming up. You might, your legs might break off or something, but it's so cold, so you have to warm up for 20, 30 minutes. I know in Malaysia it's hot, you still have to warm up, you get injured. And the same thing goes for when you want to learn. Then there's on. Okay, later it's okay, thanks. Okay, so you need to have a warm-up. Another one is the physical environment. I think uh, Prof. Rosan has a lot of slide, uh, slides on how the physical environment changes the way we learn. For example, this environment here, is this conducive for group work? This, this hall It's made for presenter. Uh, so, it's, it, you know, so the environment, you have to construct the environment. That's why uh, uh, when I visit some of the universities, they have made, I'm not sure about in USM, but the rooms are such a way that tables and chairs and all can move around so you can create design according to what you want, the learning activities, which is very important. And then learning design. And then teaching for mastery, okay? They talk about teaching for, uh, are you familiar with the term teaching for mastery? The idea is that your job is not just to go here and give a lecture. Your job is to find ways to, to, to actually make the students learn. In a sense, so your measurement is not what you teach, the measurement is how your students perform. And now with technology, that is easier, because we can have online uh, tests, and so we can actually test uh, whether they're mastered and so on. And it's not enough, they talk about that. I mean, what's the point of learning things that you cannot apply? So they say, how, how teaching for applications? So whatever you teach, hopefully most of it, students can apply in their life or work and so on. And then assessing learning, okay? Uh, the idea is to assess more authentic learning. I mean, like a multiple, I give an example. Uh, I got, last time I did uh, MBA course, not the program, MBA course, I got A, okay? But most of my questions were multiple choice. You know, does that make me a better businessman? Does it make me a better leader? If I do a leadership course and all the assessment is multiple choice, and I get A plus and I go for a job interview and say, oh, you got A in leadership, yeah. You know, so you have to, when it comes to measurement, you have to come as close as possible to the learning outcome, which is, is ideal, but it's, it's tough, okay? And then this one. This one uh, is by him again. He was in the previous slide. You remember what his name was? John Medina, okay. Uh, he has something called the 10 minute rule. Have you heard it before? Okay, I'll ask you an honest question. How long does it take before your students, some of your students start falling asleep? 10 minutes. 10 minutes, okay. We can see here, 
he did, because he scans the brain, so he saw research here, and he found on the average, uh, uh, people, uh, if, you don't, if you keep on doing the same thing, uh, the attention span drops, and it drops dramatically after 10 minutes, and then, it, okay? So, what you need to do to keep on going, say, for 45, I got three hours now, how to keep it going for three hours, okay? But the, the funny part is, if you watch a Hindustan movie, you can go on for three hours. Right, but then, then when you go to a lecture, can you go on for three hours? Isn't it weird, you can watch a movie for three hours, but you can't, nobody, anyone doing research on this? Yeah. So no, but actually the thing with movies, I know anyone watching movies, they keep on changing the scene, sometimes they're running, stop, run, stop, so you, you cannot relax, you're always in the change. And the same they say, I'm not saying you should run, but you should try to do some activities within 10 minutes, either discussion, ask a question, uh, throughout, okay? So that's what he says at the table. Okay, so I'm gonna ask you, this is uh, learning styles. Huh? So which is your favorite learning style here? You just make some noise, which one, this one? Yeah, okay, this one, logical. You, you, want, you don't like to learn illogical things. Everything must be logic, analytical, evidence-based. I don't need logical. Huh? What about verbal, you know? Okay, physical, you need to, you have to do something physical, or otherwise you fall asleep. I'm one of those guys, actually, if I sit in a chair too long, uh, my wife gets angry with me. Sometimes we go to cinema, I say, this is a, she's laughing, and suddenly she looks at the camera. <laughs> I need to be more active, okay? And then you have oral, and then I put social media and games, okay? And research shows that each learning style uses different parts of the brain. By involving more of the brain during learning, we remember more what we learn, okay? But I want to ask you something. This is very important. Because uh, I, I worked with a student that did a PhD on how to, to, to tailor the learning style to the learning preference. So is that important? Do you think that's very important? To tailor the learning style to the learning preference. Is that very important? Is it important? So if I like to learn uh, games, so you should build your learning activities content towards games. Huh? Is that good? It's difficult. So, so how do you do that? You do multi-presentation. Uh, okay. I, I, I've struggled with this, because if you tailor the learning to the preferred learning style, what do you do? The student is more motivated, right? And probably will learn more. But the only problem with this, if you do that all the time, the student will become very strong in this learning style, but will be probably weak in all the other learning styles. The problem is when the student goes to work, Say that you taught him only through games. I learned the whole master program through games. But when he starts working, he needs to know this, this, learn through these modes, and he doesn't know how to do it well. Uh, so yes, learning styles are important, we should do it, but we should also take into consideration that you need to learn all the learning styles. And I learned this when I used to play football. I know, are you familiar with Barcelona? Football club, Barcelona. Have you noticed they produce always good players? You know, and also if you go back to Ajax, they produce good players. Why do they produce good players? Holistic players. The reason is they, as far as I know, they have a matrix, actually, they don't share with you, but they have a matrix that actually, I think most good football clubs will have that. They have a list of skills that you need to learn, and they follow it up every year, like a, like a rubric. So you have like, kick with your left leg, kick with your right leg, can header, can uh, juggle, da, 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 the full list, and they give you grading after, so you, you keep on improving all the skills. And I think that's also important for learning style. Although we want to motivate on, we have to make sure that the students have good learning skills, whatever a learning style it is. Okay, so that's also very important uh, based on what, what I've discovered. Because it, it'll be sad, for, I give an example, the, the two things that, uh, that comes about again is, one is most students, not most, I wouldn't say most, many students don't have good presentation skills or speaking skills, or uh, critical thinking skills. When they go for interview, they ask them some other questions, and they go like, ah, uh, ah, uh, uh. And what is the reason for that? Is there any reason? Can you share? Why, why is this happening? That the employees are complaining that the students, I'm just, they might be wrong, but I'm just saying, they're saying that, oh, uh, some Malaysian students, they don't have good communication skills, they don't have good collaboration skills, they don't have good speaking skills, they don't have good thinking skills. Huh? Practice. practice. So that's why I say it's very important to, if you can, find ways to put that in the curriculum. 
Because actually those things are not so difficult to train. I give you an example, speaking skills are very easy to train. If you go to the, uh, I never participated, but they have things already like Toastmasters and so on. I, I went through Toastmasters, and I saw, I saw with my own eyes some students, when they came into Toastmasters, if you put them on stage, they'll faint. But by six months, they're pretty good speakers. I mean, they're not world class, but they're good speakers. So you only need about six to one month to one year to become that. That's why it's very important. I call that the hidden curriculum. That in whatever program, they should have, when they graduate, they should be able to speak, they should be able to write well, they should be able to think well, because that they represent your university. I'm not saying they're bad, I'm not saying that. I'm just saying these are critical skills, and how do you put that in the curriculum? Often referred to as the hidden curriculum. And this, this is actually, have you seen this diagram before? Is it true? Okay, so a lot of dispute. That's why I hide. I hide this one. I hide the, the numbers. I hide the numbers. Do you agree in this or not? Yes. The best way to learn is to teach. Okay. So it's very important to get students or participants to teach, well, not teach, but to share what they have learned. Okay. In many ways. MIT did a lot of research on this, and they found that it's very important for students to do well that do group work, because a lot of super brain students they don't like to do group work because they're so smart. That if they work in a group, they, they slow down. You know, you know. So that, that's it's very important to get super smart students. Yeah, you're super smart. Go and work in the group because you you have to develop all the skills. Uh, this happens often that super smart students when they go for, for example, job interview, they're super smart, but they don't know how to talk. They, there are a lot of things they have not developed because they've always been learning in isolation. And uh, Stephen, is this Stephen Covey? Yeah? Seven Habits. Yes. Have you read Seven Habits? Okay. He. It's very interesting. He. He, uh, he wrote, no, I, I, my father-in-law had a, a set of cassettes, motivation talk. I listened to it in the car. And he said something that until today sticks to my mind. And it's, it's very important. He said that when you learn and your mindset is to learn to teach, your focus goes up, your attention goes up, because you are forcing yourself to learn much more focus. You know, if I'm learning this, I need to teach it. Instead of just, I'm learning it for learning. So the mindset also, when, you, when you're learning something, if you tell a student, you're going to learn this to share it with another student, the focus will go up usually if, if mindset. And that's what he was mentioning, that it's very good when anything you learn, you think I'm going to learn to teach it to someone else. And then your focus will increase much more. Okay? So mindset, okay. Uh, any questions until now? Am I going too fast? Uh, my problem with this is, is post, it's actually a one-day workshop, but I, I, I have cut out some of the activities. Okay? But we're going to do something called Okay, let's watch a video. Super Brain Nova, an exercise intended to pump up cell and neuron activity in the brain. Alzheimer's patients, seniors looking to stave off memory loss, and kids in classrooms are among those who say doing it makes them smart. I think your right hand cut off to the left side. A medical doctor in Los Angeles describes an exercise. Inhale going down, exhale coming up. Not so their patients grow stronger, but so they become smarter. They probably had a C average. I taught him these exercises, and by the next semester, he was in a completely different chair. His grades have gone almost straight A's. Take your left hand. A teacher in Malibu saw similar improvements in her learning disabled kids. They have kids that have autism, kids that have Asperger's, all different, different needs. They were assigned the movement. Inhale, exhale. Not to shape their muscles, but to sharpen their minds. Yeah, they get smarter and smarter. Good, Brandon. One child needs to just stand there and not move. And now I'll ask him to do something, and he'll look at me, and he'll just take a moment, and then he'll do it. A teacher, a doctor. And then you take the right hand and place it over to the left ear lobe. A Yale girl biologist. Yes, I do it every day. And an occupational therapist. Oh, God. I think this might be the key to help unlock these children. All are among those experimenting with an exercise to increase intelligence called Super Brain Yoga. I would say the Super Brain Yoga is a fast, simple, drug-free method of increasing mental energy. Okay. So you want to try it or not? Who wants to try it here? I can do it with you. If you want. Anybody? Or I, no. Actually, when I, it was very interesting when I, I did this with the students. We did it, actually 100 people who did it together. I think maybe your group is not. Uh, you, you want to try or not? 
Huh? Oh, okay. But anyway, if you want, I can teach you. Because I've been doing, I've tried it out. I haven't stopped doing it. I started in November. I've done it continuously in the morning. You know, just before I go to an office, just do. You know? So it's, it's actually very nice. And, and they didn't mention here, but actually the, uh, I read a bit of research on it, is that what it does is it activates your hemispheres much more than uh, people that don't do it. Uh, so you activate the brain. It sounds great. And you, and you can guess where it comes from. Where do you think it comes from? Huh? It comes from India. Okay, you can see there they do it in the beginning of the school. You see that? In the morning, they start this activity. And then it came to Malaysia. What happened to Malaysia? Only for students that were punished. <laughs> and that's why they became so successful late in life. Huh? <laughs> no, but it's actually a very good exercise. You should try it. If you have knee problem, no. Okay, and I, I'll, because I read about, if you have, this is for ladies, if you have menstruation, don't do it. You should only do it uh, non menstruation period, okay? Uh, but you should try it. Uh, but I have an alternative, okay? It's this one. Uh, this is also from yoga, uh, it's a very popular one. It's alternate nostril breathing to activate your whole brain, okay? Why is this oxygen so important for the brain? Anyone want to share? Why is oxygen so important for the brain? Okay? How big is your brain compared to your body size? 2%, right, 2%. How much, how many percent oxygen does it consume of your oxygen coming in? Anyone? 20%, yeah, 20%. It consumes a lot, and you need a lot. And what happens when you're working? I had this problem last time when I, when I work. When I think hard, I forget, forget to breathe. You know, you're thinking, I mean you breathe, but you're closing your mouth, you're not, inhaling properly, and then sometimes at the end of the day you get headache. How many of you get a bit headache after working the whole day? Only a few. But one of the reasons you're not getting enough oxygen to your brain. And uh, I, I was looking there, if you look at some of these videos, it, actually if you want to do it, you can actually, what you do is you, you start with your, this one you start with your right, inhale, and then, and then, and you do it, but you do it a bit longer every day, three to five minutes. Try it out. I mean, I know these are new things for you, but this is actually again from yoga. But see, these people, very interesting. The Americans, they have brought it to US. And what they do when they do it, they scan the brain. And they see the activity in the brain after doing it, and they find it is it, helpful. Especially the super brain yoga. OK. OK. So this is brain waves, OK? Have you seen, are you familiar with brain waves? OK. This guy here, have you seen him before? Which movie? Okay, now that's not the question, that's easy. <laughs> which state is he in? He's in which of these states? Huh? Beta? Beta? How many, can you just raise your hand, Beta? Raise your hand. Beta? Beta, come on. Okay, what about uh, gamma? Gamma, oh, this is like 50-50 lah. The rest definitely not lah, relax, he doesn't look very relaxed. Actually, I think, I, I'm not, I didn't ask him, but usually people, uh, when they're at that state that they're innovating and they're totally engrossed in it, they are in gamma state, active thought. They're totally engrossed. And that's one of the, I don't know if you experienced it. Have any of you experienced that you have, uh, maybe it's you're doing your research and suddenly the idea comes to you and you cannot sleep for two, three days, you must write it out. Uh, that's the state of gamma. And that's the, the, the most effective in terms of innovating and so on, okay? But in terms of consuming knowledge, which state is the best? Consuming, I mean that you want to just uh, grasp as much information as possible and s store it and then be able to recall it. Alpha. 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 Okay, alpha, okay? Uh, but if you go to Google, you, you can actually Google and you can Google for theta, theta waves, for learning, or theta waves learning, you actually can download, or not download, you can view on YouTube, uh, mu music supposed to stimulate you into theta uh, and alpha. But those two both, alpha and theta is a relaxed mode, and they seem to be, you, you're, you're better to consume information and understand and so on in a relaxed mode. But I think if we can do this one, delta, which is learn while sleeping, could be very powerful. I give an example, how many of you have dreams? Uh, sometimes the dreams are so real, right? 
and the memory is fantastic. You know, so that's why you want to get into that state. If you can have, wouldn't it be nice, you go to sleep, you wake up, you can speak French? <laughs> you know, when you, especially, especially if I'm a, say I'm uh, the Prime Minister, President Najib, I'm going to visit China, uh, he's in China, right? I, I, I go to sleep, I listen, I, I just close my eyes, and then come back, I can speak Chinese. Or Mandarin, or you know, whoa. Huh? But you don't, then, then you copyright the technology, you don't share with them, right? Just, so every country goes, he speaks their language. At least a, at least a few sentences, right? Okay, so this is very important. And, and which state are we mostly in? <laughs> beta. And this is the problem. When we want to learn stuff, we are mostly in beta. So you know, how many of you have read a page and then ask yourself, what did I actually read? Have you experienced that? Or you are so sleepy, that's even worse. When you're so sleepy, you spend one whole hour on that page. Huh? And you haven't moved. Only you have moved, not the page. Huh? You have experienced that? Because you, you said, I want to finish this page. I've had that problem, so I want to finish this page, and the page and the book is on my face, but I'm still going after it. Uh, that's when you should do what? What should you do at that state? Huh? Yeah, power nap. Take a power nap. You know, that's why but, um, your boss might get angry. Uh, actually, they should do that. You know, in China, I think it's China, some school, Japan also, they sleep 12, 12, 20, sleep for 20 minutes. Power nap is very good. Even NASA did research on that and they found that they were more uh, productive if they had that power nap. Many top athletes in the world, they will actually go to uh, hypnosis or self relax for five to 10 minutes, uh, one hour or two hours before the game. So they're totally uh, energized, okay? So maybe you should have, uh, after lunch, power nap. Even the sunnah of, in Islam, you should have, is it before the whole, right? Or just after the whole, after makan? Just have a power nap or a stomach nap. Uh. But it's good, it's a sunnah, so, but we're not practicing it, huh? okay? It's not natural, actually, if you look through history, I was reading about history of sleeping, if you go into Google, this idea of sleeping the whole night and not sleeping the day, it really started because of industrial, re uh, industrial revolution, because they wanted to work, you know, they don't want you to sleep, the machine is running, so you made it work the whole day. And we have picked, kept it up, and it's now it's fast, because how many of you get sleepy after lunch? And you don't take that nap, and end up, the rest of the day is very productive. Especially if you have, uh, what? Uh, what's your favorite lunch meal? Brani, eh? Brani is the worst. Uh, you eat brani uh, before Friday prayers, the, Friday pray, uh, the, the khutbah goes on, and I'm seriously, when you go to khutbah, at least 50% are just having that power nap. <laughs> and they realize they're so productive. Actually, Fridays ended up so productive, because they had, they, they, nobody know that they had the power nap, but they had that power nap. So maybe we should have more power naps, huh? It's part of the program, okay? Okay, I think we're gonna stop now, because we want to focus. So, because I think this, okay, so we will leave it from here, and then we'll come back, what time, huh? Huh? What time we come back? Oh, oh is it too early? Yeah, 10 more minutes. Oh, 10 more minutes, okay, I go on 10 more minutes now. Okay, I go on 10 more minutes. Okay, so this is, uh, everybody knows who this is. Okay, I just want to read out what he says, because it's very interesting. Focusing is about saying no. Okay, he didn't say this about Facebook, okay, but uh, I think this is a challenge for us today, and students, right? When you're working and you're really stressed out, sh the question is, should I work on this stuff or should I go on the social media and have a chat on WhatsApp? Maybe you guys are WhatsApp, like, have a chick, eh? Yeah? And then suddenly you end up like half an hour gone. Half an hour gone, oh, wait, wait. So he says, people think focus means saying yes to the thing you've got to focus on. But that's not what it means at all. It means saying no to the hundred other good things that there are. You have to pick carefully. I'm actually as proud of the things we haven't done as the things I have done. Innovation is saying no to 1,000 things. Okay, it's a bit extreme. But you notice, when the iPhone came out, it revolutionized mobile, edu uh, not mo even mobile education. And you notice how many uh, different phones did Apple launch? One. At that time, Nokia was having like, I don't know how many, at that time it was like 20, 30 years, 40 different devices, right? So, uh, yes, you can have multiple devices, but the reason, I think one of the reasons besides Steve Jobs is he managed to put all his best people into this one phone while Nokia had to focus on all the different versions and so on. So they, there's no way they could keep up with innovation. And now you see most have followed the trend. Even Samsung now don't have that many different kind of phones. They, they focus on time. So it's very important to focus. 
Now, the, this is the last thing we're going to do. Maybe we can do this activity, because it's good to think before we eat. Eh? OK? Uh, have you seen this before? Albert Einstein's destruction index drill? If you go to any uh, workshop on this super brain and blah, blah, if they don't have this, then you should be disappointed. But this is a, a, a technique. Some people say that he didn't invent this. Some people say he did. But one thing we know about Einstein is when he was thinking about an idea, he could focus for extremely long periods on that and not be distracted by anything. They call it, what do you call it? The, the, in, it's, a, it's a content, the, not the distant professor. What is it called? The absent-minded professor. Okay? But in the sense that he could focus for long, he could even, according to the record, is he could focus for 42 minutes without any distraction, just on the idea. And according to the story, he came up with this uh, tool. They call it, uh, they, now they call it Albert Einstein Distraction Index Drill, a method to empower you to focus and concentrate. So do you have problems with focus? You OK? Huh? Your students, are they very focused? OK. So let's do this test. Can we do this test? Do you have anything to read with? Anything to read? A book, your handphone, email? Huh? OK, so, so basically this method is like this, OK? You don't have to use these words. Huh? Write, I won't be distracted by that anymore on a piece of paper. You don't have to, you can just say focus. Set a timer for three minutes and start to read a book, article. Just read something that you work. When you experience a distraction, just tick. Huh? Each time you're distracted, read, like you don't have to read point, just say focus. Focus, silently to yourself, then start reading again. When the time goes off after three minutes, count the number of distractions. I give an example. Say I'm reading an article, and suddenly I start thinking about my wife, or I start thinking about my kid. Oh, that's one distraction. I'm reading again. And I say, what did he say on Facebook? Another distraction. And then, and actually, you, then it's, it's a kind of tool to check how not focused you are on, and how focused. The idea is to train your mind to be more focused. Uh, it's a very good tool. If you maybe you want to try it here, you go back to your office, you read anything, and you have just a tick, tick. So every time you're distracted, you tick, and then you're supposed to, because this is, actually, if you look from hypnosis, it's self-hypnosis that you're saying to yourself, I will not be distracted. So you learn how to focus. And I think uh, because of all this uh, social media and so on, uh, we're, we're not as good as focusing as previous generations. Maybe you're, you're, you still have that. But anyone that's got into social media, just TV media, we're distracted all the time, and we cannot focus. But what we do know is most of the uh, super creative, innovative people, they had that ability to, to, to go into a zone. They call it a zone. And they can just switch off and just get engrossed in their, whatever they're doing. And I think we, because of today, there's so much distractions, we need to train back our focus. And this is a very good tool. Uh, you can find here, if you go to the slides, which is available on SlideShare, it's available on my blog. Uh, you can you just click on this link, and you'll go to the uh, an example of how to do this. It's a very good tool. And if you have any students that got problem focus, ask them to use this as a training tool. Because it's a really big problem. Uh, even when you're talking to students sometime today, uh, they, they're not even listening to you anymore. It's like, they're looking at you, but their mind is like, uh, I got this problem on Facebook. And then, oh my god, somebody disfollowed me on Twitter. You know, and they, got, they, don't, so they need to learn how to focus again. And that's so important. If you want to do something exciting, you need to know how to focus. Okay? So we're going to stop there. I think I want to summarize uh, the optimizing your mindset after the break. Okay, any questions while we're waiting? How sleepy are you? I should have a sleeping index. <laughs> actually, the, you know that they have that in schools now? They actually have, uh, in US, some schools, the students have to wear a device on their head, and the teacher will have uh, all the brain activity of all the students, and the moment the students, students dip off, they can see on the screen which students are dipping off. Um, I know I don't, it's a bit control mind freak stuff, but they actually have this kind of technology. And they, they, although they cannot electrocute the student, like, okay, wake him up. <laughs> but they actually have this technology because then they can actually measure whether they're lecturing or whatever they're doing is having any impact on them or they're falling asleep. Okay? So thank you very much. Go for, is there a break ready? Okay, they can go and makan. And then you come back what time? 10.30. 10 okay. No, too long, 10.15. Uh, 1015, sorry, 1015. Uh, I thought we learned best, best during the break. <laughs> okay, 1015. You can still makan here, right? Or you're not allowed to eat here? Downstairs, okay. 1015. Okay, thanks.